This is not going to be formal. Dave has already been on task today, and I'm retired. So, <laughs> so there's going to be nothing formal. We're just going to have a few reminiscences. And uh, I thought just to put you uh, in the right era, I would just tell you a little bit about where we were at the time. The year was 1968. There were no computers. There was no HTTP. There was no email. There were no iPods, iTunes, Twitter. Uh, there was no reality TV. There was no such thing as interactive. You just sat and you listened. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States and we were at war with Vietnam. Biology was in Gladfelter Hall, third floor, no elevator. <laughs> I was getting ready to teach the second year that I was here in general biology. Uh, we had scheduled about 300 students. We taught general biology in Master's Hall, <clears throat> which is the indoor stadium on campus. <laughs> All of the laboratories, however, were up at the third floor of Gladfelter. So there was quite a bit of movement around. Uh, it was maybe a Friday night or a Thursday night that this young man walks in. Were you with the student or an administrator? Do you remember um, who I might you came in? With with? A okay. Yeah. All right. Nice looking kid, taller than me. <laughs> Blonde. You had your caps on. You had bright blue yeah, eyes. Yeah. Okay. We started talking. You couldn't tell by looking at Dave that there was anything wrong other than the fact that he had a cane. If he had not had the cane, you would not have realized he was blind. He held himself beautifully. We talked for a while, and then he started hitting me with things that I was not expecting. He said to me, I've come up here to try to find the location of my laboratory in Bio 101. I said, laboratory? He says, yes, I'm enrolled in Biology 101. I said, gee, Dave, I, said, I don't know. And you heard this a lot. That's going to be impossible. I said, Dave, I don't know if, if, if we can do this. I said, why don't we go ahead and have you enroll in the course and we'll waive the requirement for the laboratory. That you, this way you could fulfill your distribution requirement in sciences. He says, no, that's, that's not going to work, sir. And I said, uh, why not? He says, because I want to major in biology. I says, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and I was serious. I was shocked. I was nervous. There were 300 kids coming in this class. I was tired. And here this kid who's blind, and remember, we didn't have euphemisms like uh, challenged. He was blind. <laughs> He says to me, no, he says, I have to take biology. Uh, I says, why? He says, I want to major in biology. You hit me with this a little at a time. And I said, Dave, have you thought about something like history or sociology? I said, you know, there's so much less requirement for visual activity. He says, no, I have to major in science because I want to go to medical school. <laughs> Holy Christ. <laughs> I remember stepping back and almost falling over a stool like that. <laughs> and it was funny because he was standing there with his cane and he must have realized that because he lifted his cane right away to catch me. <laughs> I said, really, I don't know if this is possible. I said, we're having a hell of a hard time getting kids with sight in the medical school. How, how can we possibly do anything here? So, you know, he had a tremendous sense of humor, and he laughed like, you know, he is now. And he said, well, uh, let me try. Well, let me just try it. And I said, geez, you know, you're, it, uh, it is, this is going to be very, very difficult. He says, well, you know, and I remember he said, you really shouldn't deny me the, the opportunity to try it. He says, let me try it. If it doesn't work, I'll know right away. 
So we spoke for a little while longer, and he finally convinced me, and that was it. That was the beginning. Do you remember it like that? I do. Well, um, I, from my side, I remember sitting through uh, one of Ralph's lectures, and he is magical in the lecture hall. And uh, I sat in that lecture hall and listened to him, and I thought, that is the man that I need to talk to about this crazy idea. And so when I went up to talk to him, and he came up with ideas like history and sociology, I thought, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> this is going to be harder than I thought. <laughs> and um, then he told me to you know, stop into the lab. He'll think about it. So I came in Monday. And Monday morning, or Monday afternoon, it was lab, mm -hmm. he met me at the, the lab. And he was a whole different person. He was just full of energy, excitement, enthusiasm. Uh, he was, and for the next four years, was sort of an inspiration to me to keep on track. Um, and his lecture continued to be spectacular. As I was telling him coming over, I don't know of any professor in four years that got a standing ovation for one of their lectures. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think Ralph exemplified the feeling here at Gettysburg. Um, Al Schroeder, unfortunately, is, is uh, deceased, but he was another very powerful influence. He spent hours and hours drawing these raised line drawings uh, in order for me to learn histology. And his comment was, Dave, if you're going to apply to medical school, you're going to have to take my course in histology or you're just not even going to be looked at. We have to figure out how to do it. And he did it through tremendous work. Now, I remember uh, he would always give me exams myself, individualized. And I remember one day studying my brains out for a, a examination. I was nervous. I usually pulled all nighters. I, <laughs> I didn't think you should sleep before exams. Uh, but anyway, I went down, <laughs> went down to his office. And he should have done it in Braille. He didn't. He had it in print. It says, Gone to the World Series. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yep. <laughs> I thought, well, he's got everything in perspective. Um, but Al did a huge amount in, uh, and I feel bad. I don't know whether any of you saw the movie, but the movie um, depicted Al as sort of the naysayer and, and Ralph as the positive. But uh, really, both of them were very powerful enthusiasts of, of my crazy idea to go to medical school. Um, and and um, just before coming in here, I got to talk to Alan, uh, Helen, mm -hmm. Helen we, uh, Winkleman. And, um, you know, Helen was amazing uh, in our lab. She helped uh, a friend Don Johnson and I work together on an, uh, comparative anatomy. And it was, it was just amazing how much effort she and, and John Winkleman put in to help me learn anatomy. Another, an, another course that was very vital uh, to me convincing medical schools that I could, I could learn gross anatomy. Uh, and, and they were very, very helpful. Um, and then Al Schroeder also took physiology. And I was reminding Ralph of the story that um, when I was in the lab, I would work with a student. And, the student in his class was Dan Baker, who's gone on to be a researcher with one of the pharmaceutical companies, a really brilliant student. And he and I would share a lab together. And he would do most of the experiment. And I felt like I wanted to be a little more involved. And he wasn't sure how to, how to get me involved. And I told Al this. And, and Al said, well, I'll get you involved next time. I'm sure he was laughing all week to think of what we were doing that next week. The next week, we were studying the digestive tract of cockroaches. <laughs> and my job was to carefully pull the heads off these cockroaches. And if you did it just right, the whole intestinal system came with it. And I'm proud to say I never threw up the whole time. But I, <laughs> it was not far from my mind. And I felt very involved in that experiment. But he also um, he had a, a physiology class on the heart. And I'll never forget how excited he was 
to have this, he had turtles, and mm -hmm. he had me feel the heart of a turtle as it was beating. And that, you know, that'll be a memory that just always will stay in my mind. You know, our cadavers, they just wouldn't let them beat the heart while we were feeling <laughs> it. I thought they were a little picky on that. Um, but there were so many ways in which this department really uh, got very involved in helping me find ways to learn and study uh, biology and the sciences. Um, I think Bill Parker, is he still teaching? Yes, mm -hmm. Bill. Uh, he was, uh, he and Alex Rowland were my chemistry teachers. Again, they were very critical in, in helping me learn uh, chemistry, which of course is very vital to getting into medical school and biochemistry. Let me just say that to yeah. begin with, uh, students were very reluctant to work with Dave <clears throat> in lab. They were kind of nervous because you know a lot of our labs run with groups and they were just afraid that uh, he wasn't going to be able to carry his load. But boy, were they wrong because they didn't realize he was much smarter than they were. <laughs> in the area in genetics, you have to visually look many times at phenotypes, uh, the color of beans or the color of flowers, the shape of wings, uh, the shape of corn kernels. And then you put all of this data, all of these data in a mathematical formula and you figure out percentages. You figure out the genotypes of the offspring and you figure out the possible genotypes of the parents. Okay? So of course, Dave couldn't tell the difference between colors, but as soon as the students gave him the phenotypes, he could figure out the mathematical formulas and the offspring faster than they could. It was amazing. He even did the same thing to me. We would sit in, in, the, uh, uh, in my office working out genetics problems, and I'd give him a genetics problem, he'd sit there, and as soon as I finished with the problem, he came up with the statistical results. And it, he did this over and over. I said, Dave, how the hell are you doing this? I said, you're getting the answers faster than I am. He says, well, he says, when you read those problems, are you figuring them out right away? He says, no, I'm writing them down and putting it in a, in a stepwise picture. He says, well, as soon as you tell me what the problem is, I'm already calculating it. So he was already two or three steps ahead of me. Are you? <laughs> in class, he sat, in class he came down the stairs in masters, sat in the first row, take, took out his, what did you call that thing with the stylus? I always call oh, it, it a Oh, it was a slate, slate and stylus. Slate, slate, slate and stylus. stylus. It was a soft cover with a piece of cellophane over it. And if you hit it with a stylus, it would raise the lines. So we would make drawings for him, yeah. and then he would follow it along. But in class, he always asked the best questions. And I realized, too, sometimes I had to draw things on the board. And I know he couldn't figure out what they were. So I would quickly go over to the side, explain it to him, and then we would talk about it later in class in my office. You know, I think one of the, the comments I would say about my experiences in, in undergraduate and in medical school is that a lot of times uh, the assistance that I received really helped everybody. And, and I think, um, for example, there was a, a professor in medical school that was drawing on the, on the board and writing on the board. And the other students would push me. They'd say, Dave, he's not saying what he's writing. Will you get him to say what he writes? You can't do it. <laughs> of course, they couldn't read his writing, and they didn't want to say that. <laughs> now, I never heard that with Ralph. Though. You, they could read your writing. But, um, you know, I think sometimes having a blind student class does help the whole system uh, in, in, in reaching out the accommodations. Now, I will confess, I, you know, when you're sitting in class, you're listening, you're trying to focus. Of course, it was Saturday morning at 8. Um, sometimes your eyes get heavy, you start getting a little drowsy. And I did break a new record, I think, in medical school, dozing through classes. I had a tape recorder. And the tape recorder, now this is, and you can see how long ago this was. 
it didn't automatically stop when it came to the end. <laughs> but we created in, in the uh, adaptions for the blind a little beep that would go off at the end of the tape. So I would sit in class and I figured, you know, the recording was listening and I was listening. Maybe we didn't both have to listen. <laughs> and I would go to sleep. And then this thing would come to the end of the tape and go beep and I go like, you know, like no one knew I was sleeping and I'd jump out of my chair. <laughs> uh, there were students in medical school that actually taped that little beep, waited for me to go to sleep. <laughs> and they, and they uh, ran it. <laughs> Uh, the students, you know, were extremely helpful. Um, they, I, I remember my first year, uh, there was a Tom Atherholt um, that was part of the Sigma Chi fraternity, and he had seen me and said, Dave, if you ever need a reader, I'll be glad to read you. And I said, well, you know, I'm glad you asked, because, you know, Monday night I need a reader at 9 at night. And he said, well, I will be there, and I'll help you. And, you know, it was really much appreciated. Only at 9 o'clock Monday night, I waited and waited and waited, never showed up. And so I ran into him, and Tom is a wonderful person. I mean, it was the last person that you think would ever, you know, stand <clears throat> up. Well, the next day I ran into Tom, and I said, Tom, did, did you forget? He said, me? He said, you weren't there. I said, I was waiting in my room. He says, well, I came over, and the lights were off. <laughs> <laughs> But the students really uh, very helpful. Now, Carla, I lived in the lamp post. It is that's a dorm now, isn't it? Lamp post. So the whole thing is. It, yeah. Before well, it was at that the time it was a restaurant. Yes. Yeah. And the restaurant had the best donuts. Absolutely. You, you get that at eight o'clock. They were hot. And a pound a piece. A, a, a pound. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you could get, now this is how long ago, you could get two donuts and a cup of coffee for 25 cents. It's hard to imagine. But anyway, um, there was this tr the crossing of Carlisle Street, which was a little tricky. Um, and the students up there would always help me. Of course, they would put bets on whether I was going to make it that day. <laughs> And they'd always say, you know, Dave, just throw me one. I want to win this one today. Uh, but they would run downstairs and tell me when I could go across the street. And then sometimes they wouldn't be there. So I'd be trying to cross the street and trying to listen to, and of course, I, I don't know whether it's changed, but in my day, Carlisle Street was actually the local racetrack. Is it still that way? Um, Anyway, I was down in the street, and I'd hear this lady from across the way say, you can go now, I think. <laughs> About halfway through, I hear her thinking, I'd dash. <laughs> or another time, they said, you can go now, hurry. <laughs> I remember one time crossing, and I was about halfway across, and I could hear this car bearing down on me. And the president of the college, I think it was Dr. Hansen. Hansen. Yeah, he said, wait right there, wait right there. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm in the middle of the street, no way. <laughs> I put my head down and ran. <laughs> but the students were, um, were just wonderful. Uh, they really uh, you know, reached out, they helped, they did a lot of reading for me, uh, helped me across campus. Now, one of the problems I did get into was that uh, when, when I would have readers and assistants across campus, well, when I would walk across campus and a young lady would come up, I'd take her elbow, and that did not help my relationship with my, my wife. Or at that time, <laughs> my girlfriend, she, Sherry said she was sitting in the class one time and she saw me holding hands with this girl walking along. She just stood up in class <laughs> over the window. Um, but blindness at some point, at time to be a little bit of an advantage. The D Delta, is Delta Gamma still here? Yeah. Well, Delta Gamma, um, is it, I think it still is their, That's their national, national focus, isn't it, for helping blind? Yeah. And uh, I had a number of readers from Delta Gamma that would read to me. Now, I, I got to be honest with you, in, in those days, and I bet now too, the Delta Gammas were always very young, very attractive women. 
And so my friends that lived up on the lamppost with me would line up to watch what reader was coming by <laughs> to read to me. <laughs> uh, but they were very kind and very helpful to me. Uh, it was a very, very nice community that, that I was able to experience then. Your speaker just went off. The speaker just no, went off. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you want to open up for questions? Yeah, let me just pause there and, and ask you if you have any ideas or remind any, any, I don't know if anybody was here at those days. Ralphie, I've got to say something just quickly. Uh, I was David's classmate. Uh, uh, we both graduated in 72, and we both sat in on your question. Yeah, but I remember you used to sit in the back. <laughs> And you used to hide so I wouldn't call on you. Well, I, I would say, to add to that, I would say, you know, you're sitting here in a room with the best of the worst student of the worst student class. <laughs> uh, I actually do remember, David, uh, we had uh, dinner together in Servo a couple of times with other people, not just one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember what a, a thoughtful and, and just simply uh, on top of things, person who was, I remember being partner. impressed by that. My partner, uh, history. David joined the fraternity, I don't know if he talked about that specifically, I came to a couple minutes late. And so in, in, in the, the Gettysburg College of the late 60s, it was a much more tribalistic society. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean that quite seriously. Uh, once you joined the fraternity, you tended to hang out with your fraternity. And in addition to that, David was obviously deep into the sciences, and I was into a different realm of studies. And so I don't think I actually had a conversation with David after our freshman year, but we certainly, I certainly followed his career with great interest and great pride, as I think anybody associated with David for does. And, and of course, Ralph, uh, who, amongst others who were great with David, uh, went the extra mile uh, because, number one, it was the right thing to do, and number two, you had a person who was extraordinary. And uh, you just lived that creed and that life, David, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, you were you in the chapel council then? I was with the Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Okay, you were involved in. Um, but I, I think the magic was the the communication between us, the interaction. I think it was a magical time. It was a time when we had a number of very um, uh, uh, young, energetic professors that really. Um, were very creative and, and uh, uh, very imaginative. Um, I think the student body was a wonderful student body. Uh, we were very lucky that we all worked well together. Uh, I was just very fortunate, I think, to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, it's interesting, um, at lunch we had a discussion of the American uh, for Disabilities Act and you know, it was, it was a situation where they didn't need a law or a requirement. It was the way we all felt, and, and that made it very magical. Uh, you commented on the fraternity. I was in the Sigma Chi fraternity, and, you know, one of the problems that blind people, disabled, have is that they feel aside. They feel like academically, you know, they can perform, they do well, but socially they don't feel part of a community. And when I came to Gettysburg, I was extremely fortunate to have Sigma Chi uh, offer a, a spot for me, to embrace me and bring me in, and made me feel at home in their community. And, and I was very, very uh, thrilled to have that welcoming and acceptance. And, uh, and they also did another thing. They treated me like any other pledge I had to eat as many onions as everybody else, <laughs> and um, I had to stand up. We did guard duty on Hell, um, hell Week, and uh, had to stand outside marching up. But I had to do that, and they, they made sure I was part of the gang. I had to do everything everybody else had to do. Um, so I, I, I feel there were so many dimensions. And of course, uh, John Van Orsdale was head of the chapel council, which was a a wonderful experience. I, I remember going down to John Van Orsdale. I had been dating Sherry, my wife, who's, who's here. Do you want to just um, wave your arms so everybody knows who? <laughs> <laughs> Sherry uh, was truly uh, 
made the, the whole experience magical to find my fiance here. And, and I was debating whether to, to ask her to marry me. So I went down to um, John Van Orsdale and, and I thought the chaplain would be the right person. Well, he said, well, how do you feel? And I raised this concern, that concern. And at the end, he says, well, maybe you ought to, you know, take your time and think about it. I probably should have come to you, Ralph. You would have given me the straight. But anyway, he, he was very, uh, uh, you know, reflective and supportive. So I left there and went up and saw a guy named Tom. And I'm trying to think of his last name. Tom Beers, was it? Might have been. But anyway, he was an um, interesting fellow. And I came up and he said, uh, well, why don't you talk to Van Orsbaum? I said, well, I was debating whether or not to ask Sherry to marry me. He says, well, Dave, the only way you know that is to date every girl in the whole world. I said, well, I can't do that. He said, I go ahead. You know. <laughs> it was very common to have uh, chaperones at uh, events off campus. And if you, and of course, you realize that drinking was absolutely forbidden. And so there was usually no drinking supposed to go on at these events. Well, one night they had an affair at the Hickory Bridge Farms. And uh, we, Shirley and I, uh, agreed to chaperone. And we walked into this place and it was an absolute madhouse. <laughs> and there was dancing and singing perspiration and sweat all of it. So we looked across. There was no beer there was. No, there was no beer. No alcohol. Everyone was drinking 7-Up. <laughs> so we noticed Dave was sitting across uh, the uh, room. And from where we were, it looked like he was alone. And Shirley says, oh, Ralph, we better go over and see if Dave's all right. He might be very lonely. By the time we got there, then we realized that there were women all around him. <laughs> and he was perspiring, sweating like everyone else. And, and somebody said, hey, Rod. And Shirley said, Well, you know, the, the, the students really embraced me very well. Um, and, and, and the fraternity helped. Um, we were, I guess, the first year, we didn't have rush till the second mm -hmm. semester. And um, so it, it, the community here was very warm and supportive and embracing. Um, any other questions that you can think of or thoughts or? Remembrances or um, I work in academic advising and I work with uh, two visually impaired students here on campus. Did you go to a high school and grade school that was a sighted school or were you in a school for the blind? Good question. I went to um, public school for three years because I could see up until I was eight. Then I lost my sight at eight, went to a school for the blind, Overbrook, for five years. And um, that was an interesting experience. Overbrook was a very uh, archaic situation. Um, it was a very uh, conservative. Uh, I remember complaining because I had to learn basketry. And I said, you know, I think, you know, I'm going to be doing more than weaving baskets. I mean, why couldn't I look at some other career? And they said, well, Dave, we hope you do, but if, you, if your career falls through, you'll always have a backup. <laughs> now, I tell that story now, but I've heard that there are people making $500 a basket down in South Carolina, so maybe that wasn't such a silly... But it, at the time, you know, I was really uh, humiliated. Um, and then about the age of 13, I went to a public school from eighth grade on. And the experience in public school uh, was that I, you know, everybody was there to help me learn the material, to learn the classes. But socially, it was a whole different uh, experience. What helped me socially 
was wrestling. Now, I was not a great wrestler, but I could at least meet people on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think being involved in sports was extremely helpful. Um, John earlier today mentioned that swimming had helped him bounce back. And I, I think sports, it helps you feel active. Of course, wrestling, you, you know, you could, you, you could look like a, and I could hold my own en enough that I didn't look pathetic on the mat. Um, and, and now I did, I did ha get a, a cheerleader. This sort of was one of my exciting moments in high school that she wanted to meet the blind wrestler and I was just going nuts. And then she said, you want to come over and help me babysit? I thought, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over, we're sitting there helping her babysit and her boyfriend comes in and that's always a downer. <laughs> I don't know why he had to show up. But, um, you know, it made me feel normal to be able to compete and help me to get involved in the community. When I got to Gettysburg, I tried the same trick. I tried to wrestle, and um, I noticed that wrestling had gone, gone uphill to college, and I had a perfect season. I lost every match. Now, there was one, <laughs> there was one I thought I was going to screw up, but at the last minute he beat me, and we came out full straight, 100% lost every match. Uh, uh, but I wrestled for our fraternity, which was fun. And, um, you know, I got to meet a lot of the other students and feel it, that I could hold my own, again, in a competitive situation. Explain how you took exams. Well, um, most of the time what we would do is you would read me the exam uh, and then I'd either verbally give you my answers or type them down. Um, being the incredible speller that I want. Atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> now you gotta admit, the misspellings were very creative. They were. No one could have come up with <laughs> No H in chromosome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I solved that problem though. I married a woman that can spell anything, so that's the secret. But I, I would take exams that way, and then I would often type papers on a typewriter. Do, do any of you know what typewriters are? <laughs> anyway, I, I type on a typewriter, and um, you know, I, I, you can't read it back after you typed it on a typewriter. You know, the computer today, I can listen back on it. Um, but in those days, I couldn't figure out if I was typing, and I think there was one paper I handed you that had been carefully typed out in stencil, and uh, the ribbon had twisted. <laughs> so all I had was impressions. <laughs> that was a very challenging exam. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were a saint to read that. <laughs> no, but it was easy. All I had to do was take a pencil and go over it very lightly and shade it and hold it up. <laughs> Within a few hours. Yeah, but no, if the spelling was better, it wouldn't have been as bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell people, you know, in, in, in elementary school, you know you have the um, uh, spelling bees? Well, they asked me to sit down before it started. Just so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's genetic. I figured that is genetic. My son, my oldest son, went to a school called Crystal Spring Elementary School. And he you know, unlike me, he made it to, I think it was the final round in the spelling bee, and then was finally confronted with a big word, crystal. <laughs> he misspelled it. <laughs> Five years of seeing it on the wall. <laughs> so I think it's genetic. He, was right in the gym, he might have looked up and seen it. <laughs> Dave, indicate how technology has changed for you since well, that's, yeah, that's a very, very important question. Um, in, in, when I was in, in college, we had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Do, do many of you remember those reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders? And <clears throat> there are a few people in here that do. I can point, <laughs> point them out to you, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, well, you know, and they would, the tape would break or get twisted and then I'd have to untwist it uh, and, and try to get it working again. Now, it was primitive enough, a lot of times I could even fix things myself. 
Um, now, over the years, we have seen huge changes. And in the 80s and 90s, the Kurzweil machine, which is really viewed today as just a magical event where you put a book on a, on a screen and it will copy it and then read it aloud to you. Believe it or not, that's now, um, frankly, very archaic because you don't want to take the time to just put something on a screen. Now, so many textbooks and volumes are accessible through the internet. Um, and, and I think the whole scene of accessibility books is going to break wide open. In the past, in the 50s, I would order a book, a uh, fiction book, uh, possibly Moby Dick or something like that, from the Recordings for the Blind, um, and they would send me a record, a series of records that I could listen to. Today, I can go on an internet site, pick out the book, download it, and listen to it that day. Uh, in the past, you know, I'd have to call in and say, um, I'd like to order it. They'd say, well, you know, it's not in right now. Maybe in a month, we'll get it to you. It was very difficult and took a lot of patience. Today, I go on the internet, look up the book, hit, you know, uh, download, and it downloads to my computer. I can put it on a little machine about the size of my hand and listen to it. Uh, the reading today, have any of you spent time listening to audible books, like when you're driving? Well, the audible books are just wonderful. They are just so well read. They're like performances. And uh, so the writing, the reading has just exploded. Um, so I have access to books that I never had, and they're on MP3 machines. Uh, they're on small devices. I have access to the internet. And I believe in the next few years, I will be able to get a Kindle and download one of a million books onto a Kindle and have it read by synthetic reading to me. So it saves all that time of scanning a book in. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. I feel like the, the concept of walking into a library and suddenly it's all available to me. Um, another thing that, that I enjoy doing is uh, Sherry and I enjoy traveling and I really have struggled with concepts as to where different countries are, how they are in relationship to others. And I've been able to get a Braille series of maps that, that has been able to clearly define where things are. In fact, one of my students, one of my residents, bought me a talking globe that um, you just point to the globe and it'll read to you what's on it. And it's really amazing, the technology today. I feel like uh, that in so many ways that I can see, uh, because I'm able to get access to so many things that I used to feel frustrated and shut out of. Now the only thing, and we're going to try to do this up here, is driving. And uh, <laughs> Ralph, and his wife, Ralph and his wife said I could drive their car around just to see how we're doing with that one. <laughs> maybe, maybe not so much. <laughs>
I always felt that we were really honored and respected here. And it, it's just, I don't think that this community is to be taken for granted because I don't think you find that in a lot of other places. You think about all the schools that we went to, Dave, where you interviewed, and the purpose of the interview when he was applying to medical school was to convince him that it was impossible. It wasn't to listen to him to say, gee, how did you get this far? You know, it was very much, you know, telling him that it was not going to happen. And uh, that was, <coughs> what, seven schools? Seven yeah, schools. well, you know, I, I, I'm going to make one, one comment that it, it was challenging, but I don't think I ever fully appreciated some of the struggles that went, went, went on in those schools. Uh, for example, I applied to Tulane, and I think that was the first school I heard from, and they sent the letter and they sent my check back. And I, of course, was insulted that they sent the check back. And, and later, I think when the movie came out, that was part of the, the movie. I have since heard through the grapevine, and, and you never know what the exact story is, but apparently there was a dean of admissions that presented my story to the admissions committee, and they said, no, we're not interested, we're not going to interview him. And he said, well, if you're not going to take a more interest in this man, we're not even going to take his money because I don't think it's fair to him. And it was really an act of his stating to this board they didn't take my application seriously. So there was a person that was so dedicated to trying to look at my situation that he had the wherewithal to say, I'm going to send your check back. And I think it was a sign that there was a struggle there. At Yale, um, there was a lot of struggle and I, I remember being told by my dad and everybody be diplomatic you know if you if you don't get in at least don't make them angry and so I, I remember being very diplomatic and and it was at that uh, meeting where a student um, said well Dave you know you'll always be the blind doctor no matter what happens you'll always be MD blind and, and later of course it turned that into a, a story that we're all MD something. We all have a disability of one form or another, but uh, the, his comment was, you'll always be the blind doctor. Later that afternoon, I um, encountered a guy named Dr. Redlick, Friedrich Redlick, who was the chairman of psychiatry. He's actually dean, but he was a very prominent psychiatrist, and he was extremely thoughtful and was very helpful. Now, I, I don't know whether to quote him because I heard it through my uncle, who uh, had graduated from Yale, and he ran into Redlick about six months later after they had rejected me. And I think Redlick said, well, you know, those SOBs wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> but, you know, there was a number of people at these various schools that really were willing to consider. Unfortunately, there were not enough. It wasn't until Temple uh, I was able to get enough that were interested. And another final point I'll just say, when I was a junior in high school, I was wrestling with this question whether or not to apply to medical school, and uh, my mother and I met with, I asked to meet with the Dean of Admissions at University of Pennsylvania. And the Dean there was a guy named John Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy. And I went, and Dr. Kennedy was very kind. For 45 minutes though, he spent explaining to me how uh, impossible a project it would be to go to medical school, how schools just would not be able to handle it, and he just, advised me very strongly to explore other options. Well, after, you know, coming here and getting into medical school, graduating, as, as I think it was the year before I graduated, I had to take national boards. So I, I had to figure out how to take national boards. So I wrote to the national boards and I said, who do I write to? And they said, well, the, the guy that's in charge of national boards right now is a man named John Kennedy. <laughs> Uh, oh my God. So I wrote to him and he wrote back a wonderful letter explaining he'd have a, uh, it, it had to be a non-science major to read this. Or of course, some of these words are hard, you know, for a French major to pronounce, but I, I was able to do it with the French accent and everything. And um, they had this exam read to me and 
At the end of the letter, after he explained the procedure by which I would take the exam, he said, P.S., I'm glad you didn't take my advice. You know, it's amazing that he remembered me over, what, nine or ten years. Uh, but that was the type of man he was, and I think in spite of the fact he was so negative at the beginning, it's to his credit that he grew and was able to change and adapt his attitude to be very positive when I needed it. So, you know, I think attitudes do change. They are, they are slow in changing, but they do change. And I think uh, as we all work together, I, I think um, we're going to find exciting uh, future ahead of us. Where are we today? Uh, you broke ground on being blind in medical school. Are, are there many blind medical students today? Is this, is this did this open a floodgate? No, it, it hasn't. I think there's been a lot of anxiety about medical schools worrying. You know, I think the, the initial fear was, oh my God, all the medical schools are going to be invaded by blind people. You know, we're going to have to, and we won't be able to say no because of the laws. What are we going to do? Well, you know, I, I believe, I, I, I'm reaching back here, but there was about a million blind people in the country, and it's totally blind. And out of that, um, you know, most of them are people who lost their sight down the road, and there are very few that really care about going to medical school. Believe it or not, not everybody wants to go to medical. So it, it boiled down to a very, very few. Now, um, in 1995, there was a woman, uh, Fisher, Cheryl Fisher, who tried to get a medical school at Case Western Reserve. And that went through the legal struggle. She applied, they rejected her. She then re, you know, complained, took legal action, said she was discriminated against. I actually testified in the case saying that I do feel it's feasible. And we overturned the appeal. But then it went to the Supreme Court, which supported the uh, medical schools. Uh, I remember there was an admissions director from Harvard that went on and on. He, he almost sounded paranoid, to be honest with you. He said he would be frightened to think of a blind person approaching him with a stethoscope. And, you know, it just sort of blew my mind that people would be so close. And at a, such an incredible institution like Harvard, I thought, you know, I was so lucky to go to a much more sophisticated institution like Gettysburg <laughs> than be stuck at a conservative place like Harvard. Um, and, and I think it really speaks again to where you are. Now, a few years later, she never did get into medical school. A few years later, there was a student. He was, I think, first in his class at Notre Dame. I think he has brains where I don't have places to put them. He is amazing. He went to University of Wisconsin, got an MD, PhD. Um, he, I, I, I think the reason why a guy's PhD did in something, something simple like biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> But this guy is brilliant. Um, and I've had an opportunity to talk to him several times over the last year. And he is a, not only brilliant, he's just a wonderful human being. And, uh, and I feel very excited that he is, he is in psychiatry. But it hasn't been a flood. I think it's not a flood because medical schools are scared. There was some rumor that when I graduated from Temple that it cost Temple a million dollars for me to go to medical school. And I, I thought, how flattering that I was worth a million dollars. <laughs> but I promise you it didn't cost a million. Did it cost time and effort? Yes, I think it did. I think the, the faculty there had to take extra time. Uh, they were very <clears throat> enthusiastic. They supported me like I uh, received support here. And I was very fortunate. Uh, but I don't think it cost them a million dollars. And I think, yes, you can calculate out the time people put into it, and you can come up with a huge figure and scare everybody off. But I, I don't think that was the case. I think Temple pulled together. You know, just to tell you, uh, again, the fac faculty and students here were unbelievable. But when I went to Temple, the first day, Sherry said, well, why don't you put a question on the board? Would anybody be willing to read to me? I said, Sherry, that's ridiculous. Who walking into medical school is going to think about reading to someone when they're overwhelmed themselves? She said, I beg of you, please put a sign on the wall. I did so, 13 students signed their name, 13. 
And I was amazed that the enthusiasm and willingness to help me during medical school was uh, incredible. It was just a very, very enthusiastic group of students. Again, a special group of students that worked with me to get me through, and it, it was a magical experience there as well. Uh, I had had very good, good uh, student support, and you know, one of them, John Cursani, was a student I, I was with here at Gettysburg, and he was very helpful during medical school. Uh, he's uh, just a wonderful man, but I had a lot of support. Uh, okay, are there any other questions before we come to a close? Yes. Well, I, I, you know, I, I got to tell you straight up, I am blessed. I have been able to do what I love for 30 years. I, I left residency in 1980, and in spite of the fact I'm only 32, 33, I, I good. That makes me 35. 35. Right. Right. Uh, hey, it's been wonderful. Um, I, I have had great experience. I remember um, one lady I went into. And she was a wiry little lady. She was about 115 pounds. And she had two nurses with her. And she was kind of agitated, a little manic. And I went in and I said, ma'am, how are you doing? She says, you're George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. And with that, she reached out and popped me right in the nose. <laughs> well, later, I asked her, I said, ma'am, why did you punch me? She said, well, if you thought you were George Bush, wouldn't you punch him? <laughs> <laughs> I had a, another, what? Why don't you tell the uh, monkey story? Oh, the, what well, that? Yeah, that's your favorite. That's your favorite. Okay. That's your favorite. Uh, okay. And okay. then we'll quit. <laughs> well, you know, I had, um, I, I had moved to Rowan. I, I trained in Philadelphia, actually at, at Penn, where, um, where I did my residency and did two years in, in academia there and realized I just, I, I just didn't have enough, as my son said, you didn't have enough stories to tell, to really teach. <laughs> so I left there and went into private practice for about 15, uh, 20 years. But when I first moved to Roanoke, um, I would take cabs from my home out to the hospital, the psychiatric hospital where I worked. And I had little kids. And I got up one morning and I had a briefcase and I packed my briefcase, made sure everything was in it, shut it, went out and got this cab. And of course they didn't really know me. And, and um, I jump in the cab and on the way to the hospital, I'm feeling in the back seat and it was amazing. This cab driver in the back seat had a stuffed monkey. <laughs> well, I, I thought now as I felt it, it felt exactly like my son's stuffed monkey. <laughs> And then as I picked it up to look at it further, I realized the paw was caught in my briefcase. <laughs> now you've got to imagine this cab driver driving up to a house he didn't know. Some blind guy runs out with a briefcase, a monkey hanging from it, gets in and says, take me to the psych center. 